tell me when to go. Okay. Um, Ian, welcome. Um, I'd like to teach you a little bit about vents today so that you have some basic settings in mind um, in case we need your help as things get going here with COVID-19. Okay. So we're just going to learn about one mode today, which is called ACVC or assist control volume control. Some other events we'll call it just volume assist control, several names like that. They all do the same thing. So that's what I really want you to know. That's what declares for us lung protective ventilation. So that's really what we're shooting for. If you get beyond that, then you need to get help from an intensivist that can give you some further guidance. Okay. Great. All right. So there's two basic things that a ventilator does that you need to be aware of. One is that it triggers, which just means that a breath is starting. That happens by one of two ways. Um, here we use either time as a trigger if a patient doesn't try to take a breath. If the patient does try to take a breath, then the ventilator detects the flow and that flow, which I'm gonna use Q for flow, um, that flow then triggers air to start pushing. Cycling is what stops the inhalation and shifts you to exhalation. In this case, what cycles the ventilator, regardless of what triggered it, what cycles it is gonna be volume. And I'm gonna explain that a little further, okay? Uh, but just keep that in mind as some basics. So the key thing you need to know um, when you're setting up a ventilator is how to um, approach those settings and ask for the right thing and set the right thing. So whenever you're doing that, I always want you to think of it as the mode, the respiratory rate, the tidal volume, the PEEP, and the FIO2. So your mode is, for us, all we're doing today is ACVC. For a respiratory rate, a pretty safe place to always start is gonna be around 15, um, really anywhere from 12 to 20, depending on your situation, but 15 is a pretty good starting point. Your tidal volume, we always want this to be six milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. So ideal body weight is actually based on height, not on weight. So keep that in mind, have a calculator available so you can calculate your patient's ideal body weight. Your PEEP is your positive end expiratory pressure. And generally for that, we're gonna start at five. We may really need to increase that over time based on how hypoxic our patients become, but five is a good starting point as you're getting rolling. The reason that I put these in this order as you're looking at them is the mode is always gonna be your first thing, but the respiratory rate and the tidal volume are the two things that we can manipulate to affect how well a patient is ventilating. And then the PEEP and the FIO2 are the two things that we can affect to change how well a patient is oxygenating on this particular mode. Okay, does that all make sense so far? Yes, how would, how would I know as a, you know, as, as someone who's not super familiar with vents, how my ventilation is going, like what vital signs or labs would I wanna to get to make sure I, I know with oxygenation, I would look at their SATs, but yeah. with ventilation, how would I know? Yeah, perfect. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Good. So this, these settings that you asked for, I'm going to put 100% here as the percent of oxygen that you set, this is what the ventilator does. For us to know how well these settings are doing and how well your patient's lungs are functioning on that, I then need to know what the patient is doing with those settings. So the things that I want you to remember to look for with that are going to be your patient's respiratory rate, your peak airway pressure, your plateau airway pressure, your oxygen saturation, and your ABG. Okay, we're going to go through um, a few of those so that you understand what I mean by that and how those will change. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, what this is going to look like, if I had these settings set, right, I'm going to start, this is my pressure on this axis, and this is going to be time on this axis. I'm going to start at a peep of five. It's going to go up to some peak pressure, settle out at a plateau pressure, and then come back down. And this is going to be 
your six milliliters per kilogram that's gonna cause this uh, inhalation to stop. Okay. And regardless of whether the patient tries to take a breath or not, the breath's gonna look approximately like that. Okay. So let's say a patient immediately tries to take a breath, it's gonna look like that. The patient doesn't try to take a breath, it's gonna look like that. Okay, tracking so far? Yes, ma'am. All right, so let's say on this that the patient has a respiratory rate of 16 and a peak pressure of 25 and a plateau pressure of 22 and a SAT of 92% and an ABG of 7.432.72, right? These are the numbers that are gonna help us and we'll talk about what those mean in just a second, okay? All right, so let's address this peak and plateau pressure here issue. Okay. The key things that you need to know about lung protective ventilation are really two things. One is this, that six milliliters per kilogram for your tidal volume is one part of that. And the other part of that is we never want our plateau pressure to be greater than 30. Okay, so we always have to watch for that as we're going through things. Okay, so what I wanna do to help you understand that is talk a little bit about what peak and plateau pressure are. Uh, sorry, I wanna grab a, something to clean the board with there for a second. Okay, do you know what the peak pressure represents? Uh, I think so, maybe you should go over it again though. Okay, so peak pressure represents airway resistance. So when I say airway resistance, I'm talking about what your trachea and your large bronchi feel as that initial burst of air goes into them, okay? So what are things that you think would affect airway resistance? If there was anything in the airway. Okay, great, so whether it's in the airway, so what might be in the airway? So in the airway, like mucus or secretions. Or okay, like yeah, perfect. So if this is our airway and we have a mucus plug right there, then that's gonna increase our airway resistance. What else would increase your airway resistance? Maybe if there's something wrong with your tube. Okay, perfect. So kinked ET tube can do it. We talked about a mucus plug can do it. What else do you think? Well, I think that if there's anything, you know, if there's any sort of uh, airway constriction, like a uh, asthma process. Perfect, so bronchoconstriction of some type. Perfect, and so also we always think about is the patient biting the tube? Um, is there some other problem with the tubing? But this is big airways and tubing. It's gonna cause airway resistance problems. So the way you handle these issues is you listen. If they're wheezing, give them some albuterol for that. If they're not, then make sure the tube is good, make sure you can easily pass suction up and down it, try to get any mucus you can out with suction, and those are gonna be your big inter interventions that you can affect to affect your peak pressure. In general, we, we would talk about doing bronchoscopy to perhaps fix this or look at this, but we wanna avoid bronchoscopy in these patients. We don't wanna aerosolize anything we don't need to aerosolize, okay? So that's our peak pressure, is airway resistance. Our plateau pressure, you know what that is? So that's the pressure that the alveoli are seeing. Yeah, exactly. So we call that the lung compliance. And I just always think about the lung compliance problems as anything that's taking away space from where air should go. So what types of things keep air from being able to go into the alveoli where it should go? So any sort of process that's filling the alveoli, like a pneumonia or Good. like a fibrosis. Okay, what else? What else can fill your alveoli? Uh, blood. Okay. Fluid from pulmonary edema. Yeah, pulmonary edema. Protein. Okay. Or just inflammatory cells in general is sort of what we think about when patients start developing ARDS. They get those inflammatory cells that can cause that too. The other thing I want you to think about when you think about things that cause decreased compliance is if something's pressing on the lung from the outside. 
So like a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion. Okay. Do those things all make sense to you? I think so. Okay. So we don't really worry so much about what your peak pressure is in and of itself because it's hard to damage your trachea and your bronchi. This we really care about keeping this less than 30 because we don't want to damage the alveoli because they're just cells that can really get easily hurt. Okay? So for all these things, we have to address those problems, whatever that might be individually, which means we have to figure out what the problem is. Okay, so I just want you to think about it for a second so you can understand what that plateau pressure of 30 means. If I put you on six milliliters per kilogram of tidal volume, what do you think your plateau pressure would fall out around? Uh, in the high teens? Yeah, teens. maybe even like 10, probably somewhere from like 10 to 15. So that's important for you to realize that if someone's already pushing a plateau pressure of 30, that's already a pretty sick non-compliant lung. Okay, cool? Yes. Tracking with all that? All right, so we learned what lung protective ventilation was. We learned what ventilator settings to ask for and how to wonder or what we should look for to know what the patient is doing with that. Let's try a couple of situations to see how we would handle specific problems. Okay. okay? Uh, sorry, I need to get my thing again. All right. So let's say on this, my patient has a respiratory rate of 20, a tidal volume of, we'll call it 420, assuming it's an ideal body weight of 70 for that person. So we want to know then what this tidal volume is doing to the peak and plateau pressure. So let's say that our peak pressure is 30, our plateau pressure is 28, and let's say that our SAT is 92% and our ABG is 7.40. 3269. What do you know about this patient right now? That they're, uh, they have some compliance issues at, at that tidal volume. Yeah, perfect. So I know right now that they're able to breathe over the ventilator, so their brain's working mm -hmm. enough to have them breathing over the ventilator. I know that their peak and their plateau, there's not a big gradient there, so I don't have one of these problems affecting my peak airway pressure. I do have a problem that's affecting my plateau pressure, but it's not yet dangerous. It's not yet gonna damage the lungs. My SAT is completely fine, okay place to be. And then same with my ABG. I am happy with my patient at this level. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So if you call an intensivist and say, here's what I got going on, I would love you to say in one sentence, the patient is on ACVC with a respiratory rate of 15, a tidal volume of 420, a PEEP of five and an FiO2 of 100%. And on that, they're breathing at a rate of 20, they have a peak pressure of 30, a plateau pressure of 28, a SAT of 92, and an ABG of 7.4, 32, 69. I know everything I need to know about that patient. I know what their compliance is like, what their resistance is like, what their oxygenation is like, and what their ventilation is like. And I know how to help you over the phone via that one sentence. Okay. Cool? All right, so let's do another one. So let's say now my patient has a respiratory rate of 20. My peak pressure is 32. My plateau pressure is 28. My uh, SAT, we'll say is still 92, but now let's say that our gas is 7.256069. Tell me what you think is going on with this patient now. Well, I'm a little bit concerned that they're, uh, that they're more acidotic and they have a elevated PCO2. So maybe on the ventilatory side, okay. we should look at our settings. So what do you want to do about this? These are his settings. This is what he's doing with them. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do about that? Well, the best thing to do if we don't want to increase our 
tidal volumes too much because we're on lung protective strategy is maybe to increase the respiratory rate if yeah. you can. Yeah, perfect. So we don't want, if someone is on the track to developing ARDS or has ARDS, we don't want to increase that tidal volume, despite the fact that I told you that that was one of the factors that helps that, right? We want to leave that, even we can go lower, but we don't want to go any higher than six. Okay, so we can go up on our rate. The point I want you to make or point out to you is that if I have their respiratory rate set at 15 and I increase it to 18, I'm not actually increasing it because the patient's already breathing over that. So if it's important to me and I want to fix this problem, then I would have to go above 20 for the set rate. Okay, I want to introduce a concept to you called permissive hypercapnia. So in reality, if I had this patient with these settings, I'm already pushing a dangerous range for my plateau pressure. Uh, I'm already sort of where I want to be oxygenation-wise. I don't want to go much lower than that. I might not actually change anything. And that's not going to do the patient any harm as long as that, that pH stays above 7.2-ish um, and everything, and your oxygenation's in a safe range. Okay. okay? Does that all make sense? Yes. Okay. What questions can I answer for you at this time? So you said that um, you said that the, you're comfortable. What SATs are you comfortable with? 92 seems kind of low to me. Yeah, it sounds scary, right? Mm -hmm. um, these patients are getting severely hypoxic, um, and as long as we keep their lung saturations above 88%, we're not going to do any damage to their brain tissue or other tissues. So that's a reasonable goal for us at this point, to be just keeping them at a SAT above 88%. Clearly not ideal, right? You and I are probably satting 100% right now, which is where we wanna be, but we wanna avoid something we call oxygen toxicity, which is giving them oxygen they don't need. Okay. So we're gonna shoot a little bit lower, maybe that 88 to 92 range for that. Great question. Any other questions? Um, when should I call an intensivist? What peak level should I, when I get concerned that I, you know, I'm having a hard time oxygenating a patient and I'm going up on the peak, when should I yeah. get worried about? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's do another example. So let's say now my respiratory rate is 18, uh, my peak pressure is 20, and my plateau pressure is 18 and my SAT is 90 and my FiO2 is still 100%. So I don't have any room to increase my FiO2, right? That's already maxed out. What can I do now? You can increase your peak. Yeah, yeah. And we can increase our peak pretty liberally, right? So I can go ahead and take this up to 10 and see how my numbers pan out. We can even go up to 15. There's actually uh, graphs you can look at to see at what level of FiO2 you might want to take your PEEP up to. Our limiting factor there is always going to be this. We still have to keep this below 30. Okay. Okay. Does that All make right. sense? So I can keep increasing the PEEP and below if plateau is less than 30. That's correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Does that have a pretty good idea of where to go? I think so. Okay. I'll call you if I have any more questions. All right, so work on this for me, telling someone what the vent settings are and then what the patient is doing with those vent settings, and then we'll be able to help you more on the phone when you give us a call. Okay, so you All want right. me to say what, what the vent, what it's on? Yep. Okay, so, hi, Dr. Bunin, I have a patient on the ventilator. They're on ACVC, respiratory rate 15, tidal volume 4, 420, PEEP 5, FiO2 100%. They're currently breathing 18 times uh, a minute with peak pressures of 20, plateaus 18, SATs uh, are 90 on FiO2 of 100%, like I said before, so. Okay, all right. So it sounds like we have some room to go up on their plateau pressure. Mm -hmm. So let's try that and get them oxygenating a little bit better and I'll be there to help you as soon as I can. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.